Today, we're going to be playing a game that was one of many, many attempts to revitalize the beat-em-up genre. Fighters Unleashed started its journey in 2014. It had a really nice looking Kickstarter, and the devs clearly understood the genre, its appeal, and had a great love for the game they were making. But it went wrong. They made $90 when they needed 10 k and what eventually did get released is abysmal. If you know me, you know I love beat-em-ups, and you know I hate talking trash about art. I find positives and upsides and beauty in practically everything. But Fighters Unleashed is not good, and I am the game's biggest fan, so I feel qualified to say that. I spent no less than 12 hours on this hour and 15 minute video game, so I could learn its mechanics, study its enemy types, annihilate its bosses, and come to grips with its peculiarities. But it's still bad. I would argue it's the worst commercially released beat-em-up ever made, and I would dare anyone else to provide a worse one. I've played Ride to Hell, don't even come near me with that suggestion. I played Ride to Hell from start to finish for fun multiple times last year, and it's got way more going for it in terms of quality and polish. It's bad too, but it's not Fighters Unleashed. I know what I'm talking about when I talk about bad games. Fighters Unleashed is just broken, and it's broken in ways that it's hard to work with. Sometimes your character takes damage even when enemies aren't swinging at him, or when all the enemies are all dead, or even when there are no enemies on screen at all. It happens rapidly, and you can't stop it, and then you die. The game also fails to count your lives down when you die sometimes. The vehicle sections require inhuman reflexes. The special moves can't actually kill enemies. The bosses are brain dead, and the game consistently crashes after you defeat Mark in the army base. I am, as far as I can tell, the first and only person who played through the game. I finished it once as Alexia and once as Charlie. Alexia has a better moveset, but her story mode is missing most of the plot and ends on a cliffhanger. Charlie's moveset is worse, but his story mode details things more explicitly. And though it also ends on a cliffhanger, it also tells you to replay on hard mode for the true ending. To make matters worse, I used the stage select feature to beat the final boss on hard mode, and got the same message. There are two possibilities. Either the game's true ending doesn't exist, or in order to obtain it, you have to play through the thing beginning to end from a new game on hard mode. So that's what you're about to see. 10 plus hours of practice and my years of beat-em-up knowledge put to test by a game that tries, and fails oh so spectacularly, to pay loving homage to my favorite genre of video games. Hello everyone and welcome, welcome, welcome to Fighters Unleashed. We're going to be playing through the entire game on hard mode, and we're doing that because not only has no one played the game through on hard mode before, but as far as I can tell, no one's ever actually finished this game before I have. I'm preserving this game for history. I'm double and triple checking that we're on hard mode because according to the game, that's the only way to get the true ending. Now let's uh, play as Charlie because he gets the actual story. So, in Fighters Unleashed, we have a punch and kick combo. Kicks are for horizontal, punches are for vertical. You just do the punch combo if you want to knock enemies into the air, you do the kick combo if you want to get enemies away from you. When you're actually in the air juggling enemies, I recommend the kick, because if you punch enemies in the air, it slams them back down. Like I said, punches for vertical, kicks for horizontal. It's a pretty simple system, but it's fine enough. Ready. Go! 
The quickest way I've found to dispatch enemies is by punching them in the air and doing a full kick combo on them. This does not guaranteed kill them because we are playing on hard mode and hard mode means they take more hits, but it's the biggest damage dealer I've found. And uh, there's no evade button in this game or anything, but if we're in the air, enemy attacks seem to be incapable of hitting us, so we'll be jumping a lot to avoid enemy attacks. We are fighting Ninja right now. Ninja are the toughest regular enemies in the game, so it's a little bit rough that this is how Charlie's story starts. He starts with the toughest enemies available. That was really difficult to adjust to the first time I played Fighters Unleashed. When defeated, enemies will drop coins and hearts. We can ostensibly use the coins to buy upgrades, but the upgrades don't actually work. They didn't program any stat changes, so using the upgrade menus is meaningless. But hearts give us extra lives. We already have 27 of them because I played through this game twice before, but you know, you want as many extra lives as you can get when there's a game this brutally unfair to play. As for the enemy types themselves, there are distinctions. The red ones throw knives, the black ninja are the all-around ninja, and the white ninja are the most aggressive and damaging. You learn to manage them. They also have different hit points each. If we ever get overwhelmed, we can use our super meter, which is there. Yeah, this. It does not kill enemies, though. I don't know why. I don't even know if it damages enemies, but I've never seen the super attack kill enemies at any point during my three playthroughs. So I don't think it does, but it, it is useful to buy us some time at least. It has its functions. We can also get food from breakable items like this pot. It does, does not heal much. There are so many food items in this game, the developers drew so many, but the health kits like that one we just picked up are the only worthwhile ones. Food heals you so little. So the meta in this game is basically juggle enemies in the air when you can, jump a lot to avoid attacks, and it's pretty easy to cheese basically every enemy out with jump kicks, especially the bosses, which you'll see many times throughout this playthrough. But that's what I came away with after playing the game for some 12 hours, even though it's only an hour and 15 minutes long, because I really wanted to learn this game. I wanted to get as good at it as I possibly could, even though it's not a good a good game. The game has a pretty sensible three-act structure for most areas. There's the first level where you get introduced to the new enemy types and it's reasonably short. There's the second area where you do the same thing but it takes forever. And then there's a boss fight. Right now we're only on Act 1. I know you saw me complete a stage earlier, but that first stage was more of a tutorial prequel stage. This is the real first stage that we're in right now. Did you know that pack of gum we just picked up heals you as much as a whole pizza? It's true. Those those healing items heal the same amount, which is baffling to me. In every other beat-em-up I've played, healing items are coded so that you know which one heals more pretty quickly, but not in Fighters Unleashed. All food seems to be equal. Much of the soundtrack in this game is original, by the way, and I think that's noticeable because it's kind of bizarre it seems rather generic at first, but the riffs go in some strange directions. So no cool transition that time, but here we are in a new stage, and it's just like the last stage but longer. The developer originally planned to include, to include stage hazards, which are a staple of beat-em-ups, and that would have definitely made the level design less repetitive. I don't mind repetition in beat-em-ups, or in games in general, as long as the mechanics are fun and well explored. But maybe just one level would have been fine. It's the same three enemy types the whole time, and then you fight a boss. Especially on hard mode when the enemies have so much health. It would have been beneficial just to have one stage, I think. But we're gonna be here for a while punching the same ninja, so let's talk about the game, but not the gameplay part of the game, necessarily. So, uh, Fighters Unleashed sold itself as a revitalization of the beat-em-up genre, bringing back the old arcade brawler. And it's not the only game to sell itself that way. It seems almost every game that was a beat-em-up around the time period, or hell, even beat-em-ups being released in the last few years, tried to sell themselves that way. They were going to bring back the beat-em-ups, just like you remember them, but with a new twist or 
or modern restylizing or some such thing. And even back when Fighters Unleashed was in development, it, it was a weird marketing gimmick because beat-em-ups were already back. Sure, you know, there was Scott Pilgrim and Castle Crashers both in 2010, that's already a great start. But Double Dragon Neon came out in 2012. And Double Dragon Neon, as far as I'm concerned, is the greatest successor to the idea of side-scrolling 2.5D beat-em-ups. It was so immensely valuable for the genre. And the fact that games kept coming out after trying to be the true revitalization of the beat-em-up genre felt a little bit like seeing 3D platformers coming out today that advertise they're bringing back 3D platformers. It's too late. 3D platformers are already back. Did you see Mario Odyssey, A Hat in Time, Ukulele? There are so many. It's too late. Just like it was too late for beat-em-ups when Double Dragon Neon was already released. That doesn't mean you can't make more beat-em-ups. By all means, please keep making more. But I do think the marketing gimmick of we're bringing back this old genre needs to stop. Because there are more beat-em-ups now than there ever have been before. Beat-em-ups are effectively no longer a retro genre. There are so many more 2.5D beat-em-ups released in the last decade than there were during the heyday of 2.5D beat-em-ups. This is the new heyday. Like, even before official commercial revitalizations came out, Streets of Rage Remake was the essential Streets of Rage game, and Golden Axe Myth was the essential Golden Axe game, and those are both fan games free fan games. That said, Sega, now that Streets of Rage is up and kicking again, maybe it's time to bring Golden Axe back. Golden Axe 4. I know you don't think Beast Rider turned out very well, but nobody really thinks about Beast Rider anymore, so it's been, it's been long enough. I think they're ready. I think we're ready for another one. But anyway, in Fighters Unleashed's case in particular, it was startli startlingly, there's the word, startlingly similar to another beat-em-up that was being made at the same time and had very similar goals. The Takeover was a beat-em-up that was in development uh, in 2014 and 15 and for some time after that. And it too was a 2.5D game that featured 3D character graphics and a simplistic punch and kick combo system where you could chain the punch and kicks into each other and juggle enemies, and it included some vehicle sections to break up the beat-em-up gameplay. Now, do the games feel different? Absolutely. They're, they're both their own original products, for sure. But they were both trying to do the same thing and trying to do it in a similar way. So I don't think it could have helped fighters unleashed chances that the takeover was much higher profile and much more polished. So this is our first boss fight, Tetsu of the Nine Dragons. And you're going to be seeing me do this a lot during boss fights, where I jump in the air to avoid an attack and then kick the enemy in the head. Because this is the optimal way to avoid taking damage and still harm the enemy. If this is disappointing to you, I don't care. This is how I play games. I cheese them. I try to break the mechanics to see how they work. And if they break, that's not my problem. It's not my job to balance a game for anyone. You know, there is no right or wrong way to play video games. And as far as Charlie is concerned, if he wins this fight, he gets to see Megan again. And if he loses the fight, he dies. So it's in Charlie's best interest to cheese the boss too. Anyway, the similarities between Fighters Unleashed and The Takeover. Same attempt at a more modern 3D graphical style, but in a, on a 2D plane. Same basic game structure, including the three-act thing. Very similar ideas for the combo system. You know, it's just... Playing them so close together like I did, Fighters Unleashed doesn't come off very flattering. Now, I don't like comparing art as the basis for my engagement with that art. I'm just bringing these things up because I think it's a novelty, an interest to bring up. Fighters Unleashed is still a unique experience, and it has its own problems, and... I, I don't know if it's fair to say successes, but... I enjoyed playing it, so there's that. 
So, uh, about that worst commercially released beat em up thing, I, I do honestly, earnestly believe, based on my long experience with beat em ups and how many of them I've played, especially how many unpopular beat em ups I've played, that Fighters Unleashed is the worst commercially available beat em up. And I'm not even going to put a price tag on that. It can be as cheap as you want. I just want you to find me a worse commercially released beat-em-up than this, because I genuinely don't think you can. And for context, this game was $6.99 new. It is now $0.99. Cents. I feel a little bit cheated by that, but $0.99 cents is definitely more acceptable for a product like this, even if $0.99 cents may still be too much. And I'm not asking for you to find a, a worse beat-em-up, just because I'm interested in playing bad things or anything. I'm interested in seeing new things, and oftentimes things that people dislike are things I get immense enjoyment from, or even things I just think are good, in, co in contrast to, uh, to popular opinion. So, no matter what, if you come to me with a beat-em-up you think is worse than this, I'm gonna get something good out of it. I've just unlocked the secret to having a good time, no matter what fictional media I'm consuming. So, more more new stuff that's been undiscovered that I haven't heard of or seen yet, that's, that's always good by me, especially if it's in a genre I particularly like. And you might be thinking, maybe I've gone too far, maybe I've pushed things too hard in my quest for video game preservation by playing this game for 12 hours and running through it on hard mode, for a true ending that might not even exist. But my goal in life is basically to be the opposite of this guy. Not, not just unlike this guy, but to be as opposite to this guy as possible. And I think I'm doing a great job right now. I'm reminded a bit about something from one of my favorite Let's Play groups, The Men Drinking Coffee. They played some advert games that had never been preserved before, uploaded some full playthroughs of games that had never been seen, and they jokingly called themselves LP anthropologists for it. And even though I got the joke, and I thought it was cute, I, I genuinely think that's what they were doing. They were performing anthropology. Granted, this is not a huge piece of our culture you're experiencing right now, neither was that advert game they uploaded, but it is still a piece of human culture. It's art inspired by other art made by humans. It's a part of being human, Fighters Unleashed. This is someone's broken dream, and it deserves to be preserved, I think. By the way, the bosses um, in Fighters Unleashed, they normally have phases. I don't think Tetsu does, though. Which is, I think he might be the only boss without a phase transition. But anyway, more about broken dreams. If you look at the Kickstarter for Fighters Unleashed, they originally planned so many things for it. A more nuanced and sophisticated uh, combo system. Uh, a dodge mechanic, where you double tap up or down to dodge like in Streets of Rage 3 and in the Takeover. They planned for you to be able to perform get-up attacks. There were a lot of mechanics that didn't make it into the final product. And you don't need those things to have a good beat-em-up. I usually prefer simplicity in most game-like games, even. Not that my preference has determined whether something's good or bad, I just like bringing that up because I dislike developers feeling like they have to keep making games more complicated, personally. I, th I think that simple has its appeal. But in the case of Fighters Unleashed in particular, a dodge function and get up attacks would probably be immensely beneficial for quality of life reasons. Alright, finally, Tetsu's down. Finally. It is time for vehicle segment number one, and although at first it seems quite reasonable, it is actually not. They gradually introduce more and more enemies, throwing more and more stuff at you, and I feel like you'd have to be a bot to avoid it all. 
like, I, I just don't think it's reasonable. That said, there is something beautiful about ninjas throwing caltrops and kunai off the back of their own motorcycle. I think that's precious. I think it's adorable. I wish, uh, I wish more ninja were as dedicated to their ways as these ninja are. I am playing this game on PC, by the way. This is the Steam release of the game. You can still purchase it on Steam. It's 99 cents. I, uh, I wouldn't recommend purchasing it unless as a curiosity. I enjoyed it, but I'm not a normal, not a normal fellow. I do find it intriguing that the game wasn't originally meant to be released on PC unless they reached a stretch goal. I think it was the 20,000 stretch goal where they would release the game on PC and HD. Originally, it was only going to be for phones and the Ouya. But it, it came out for PC, because that's what I'm playing it on right now, even though they didn't reach their, uh, their minimum goal. Probably to recoup some of the losses, I, I can't be sure. I, I, I don't want to make too many assumptions about something like that. I just find the whole thing fascinating, because when you look at early alpha footage, the game just looks completely different. Like, some of the graphics are the same, but the elemental attributes are much more pronounced. There's a completely different HUD. There's a completely different combo counter. I, I don't know. It's... I wonder, I wonder what all had to be changed and why it had to be changed. I do send the developer emails, and I've gotten one back, but I'm not going to bother him too much because he does seem like a pretty busy guy, honestly. Says he's been working too much lately. I don't want to add more on the plate by uh, bothering him about Fighters Unleashed, but I do want some answers about some things. Not, not, not things like, why does the game look different, though? That's a bit too trivial. I'm not even going to ask about why it looks like Charlie was able to do a Yu Yu Hakusho-style spirit gun in the alpha. I'm not even going to ask that question, no matter how tempting. Anyway, the motorcycle section is just about up. Just about up. All of them will just explode at once for no reason. Yep, uh, there they go. Get ready. Go. So now we're fighting the Mad Dudes Gang, not to be confused with the Mad Gear Gang, or actually probably to be confused with the Mad Gear Gang. I'm almost positive it's a reference. There are other ones. The, uh, the diner that Charlie took Megan to is called Hagger's Castle. We fight a couple of enemies later called Billy and Jimmy. There's, um, I'm trying to remember the other reference, but it'll come to me when it comes to me. The Mad Dudes are by far the easiest enemies to fight, and if you were to play Alexia's story, these are the first enemies you fight. Charlie starts with the hardest enemies and then goes to the easiest right after. It's a bit strange, I think, but sort of a breather level, I suppose. The punks are not very aggressive. They do have these guys with cocktails that act as the projectile enemies, but the cocktails can be dodged just by jumping, and they, they're they thrown at a weird angle, which might trip you up at first, but yeah, as you just saw, they're not really a problem. You have ample time to dodge. And you know, there's something that just feels right about beating up street punks in a beat-em-up. Violent street punks, I mean. I. I don't think we should be beating up people for their fashion choices or their ideological views. I do think we should be beating people up that are trying to kill us, though. That seems fair. If you look at the game's city map and the territories all the bosses control, by the way, the the sequence of events in Charlie's story doesn't make sense. In Alexia's story, Spike is the one who captured Megan, and then Spike handed Megan over to Tetsu, who handed her over to Mark, who, and, you know, so on, until you reach Quaddle. But in Charlie's story, for some reason, Tetsu hands Megan over to Spike, which is going backwards on the map from, from the direction you'd want to proceed. Like, it does not benefit Tetsu in any way to have handed Megan to Spike instead of handing Megan over to, uh, to Mark, you know? It, it doesn't fit with their story, because the ultimate goal is to get Megan to Quaddle. Even though Charlie's story is a is so much better overall, with more character exposition and more story exposition, so you actually know what's happening, it it is the case that the order of events is a little jank because of because of the mixed up stage priorities. 
And I do genuinely care about this game's narrative, because it's part of the art, it's part of the whole. There are cutscenes there for a reason, and the game tries to tempt you with an extended ending if you finish on hard mode. That's why I'm even doing this right now, is to preserve the game as best I can. And that reminds me that the Kickstarter does provide additional information about the bosses we're going up against. Just a little, though. Like, for example, Tetsu of the Nine Dragons is from an ancient mystical ninja clan. Probably could have figured that out. And Spike is the most powerful criminal in the city. Probably could have figured that out. But, uh, at, at least that's something. They're, they're, they're where they are in doing what they do for reasons. And beating the game on hard mode wasn't just supposed to unlock an extended ending, it was also supposed to unlock a new character. I'm, I, I'm not hopeful for that. I just want the ending. I just want to see the game's ending. Like, I, I, I don't... Th there are a lot of promises on that Kickstarter that never came to fruition because of the lack of funding, and they had to se severely trim down their vision. A new character would be cute and fun, but I, I don't think they had the money. Looking at this, you can't tell me you think they had the money either. I just want the ending. That's all I'm here for right now. I've put in so much time. So just like Stage 2 of Act 1, Stage 2 of Act 2 is more of the same. It's more of the enemies we've already fought and know how to deal with, but for a way longer period of time. And this time, I'm going to speed up the process, literally. At this point, I think Charlie has to be realizing just what a mistake he's made climbing down to the subway tracks. First of all, if Megan wasn't hanging out in the subway, would she really be hanging out on the subway tracks? Secondly, subway tracks are long. They just keep going and going and going, and I think Charlie's really feeling that right now. Subway tracks don't stop. They're endless. Also, for any curious parties, that song during the montage was... One of the tapes from Double Dragon Neon, it's the song that plays when you select the knee drop power. And I like to imagine it's what Charlie was listening to while he beat up these goons. Just sort of to get him in the mood, get him through this workout. All right, so here we are fighting Spike. Spike uh, has a very particular gimmick, and we'll see it as soon as he feels like using it, but he is the most functional of the bosses, I think. Actually, maybe that's Billy and Jimmy, we'll see. But, oh, there, he started running. So what Spike does is he charges at you and you jump over him, and he gets tired after he charges enough times, and then you hit him when he's tired. Pretty simple boss design, but it functions, unlike many of the other bosses. You can't just cheese this guy to death. And that's ironic, in a way, isn't it? Because Spike is doing an extremely stupid thing right now by charging at us over and over in the same way. Like, this is not a, a real human tactic being employed right now that Spike is using. But in spite of that, he's one of the more formidable and least broken bosses. Because the other bosses that try to attack you more directly and use actual combat strategy, they're way easier to break. So being dumber just gave Spike the advantage. Unlike Tetsu, Spike also does have functioning phases. After you get his health half down, he starts charging at you faster. It looks really funny, but it's, it's a genuine phase shift at least. Ready. 
ready. Go! Here we are at the army base fighting, well, you know, soldiers. Fighting the soldiers. Corrupt soldiers, I guess? Anyway, these new enemy types have one particularly troublesome component to them. They have guns. Some of the enemies in the army base have guns. And getting shot knocks you over immediately. The enemies with guns can fire as frequently as they like. They never run out of ammo. They are by far the most troublesome projectile enemies. So that's what the time you spend fighting Mark's soldiers boils down to, is figuring out how to deal with the projectile enemies. Thankfully, it does not seem like their bullets hurt you while you're in the air, even if they do hit you, so it mostly comes down to a lot of jumping and probably trying to take out the enemies with guns before anyone else. This stage very reminiscent to a similar one in Streets of Rage, which had stage hazards. And, you know, you don't need to have stage hazards in your beat-em-up, but it probably would help with the repetition of the second stage for each act. Playing this game is giving me flashbacks to Power Rangers Mega Battle, which you can't buy anymore, unfortunately, but it was a 2.5D beat-em-up based on the original Power Rangers series, and, uh, and it wasn't awful, per se, but it is the case that it, was, it, it, it wasn't challenging, and you did the same thing a whole lot, and it sort of drove me mad trying to think of commentary. There was a part in the Let's Play where I just started playing a different game. And now I'm thinking, you know, maybe, maybe I was too harsh on Mega Battle. Maybe going back to it after having experienced Fighters Unleashed, I would feel more positively toward it. Maybe I'd find new things to appreciate. Generally, it is the case that when my opinions change, they change t toward positive feelings. That's usually how it goes. Maybe a second visit to Mega Battle would uh, would, would get me would give me a new light. Man, playing in recording Fighters Unleashed and reminiscing about Mega Battle and the other beat 'em ups I used to play on this channel has made me realize that as much has changed about myself as a person and my personal circumstance. Not, some things are the same, and probably always will be. But that gimmick of breaking up tedious games by talking over better beat-em-ups right in the middle of my video, I think that's gone for good. It was a cute gag, and it gave my mind food. That's the reason that I was having so much trouble with Mega Battle, is there was nothing in Mega Battle to think about, and it was making me crazy. But I don't think I need that crutch anymore. I think I'm so much better. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Double Dragon Neon. This is Double Dragon Neon. Pay close attention to how everything in Double Dragon Neon is the best, because it is the best. There are so many things to talk about. I've been wanting to talk about this game since I got it in 2012, and it's, it's, it's hard to think that I'm actually doing it now. But... Anyway, we have punches and kicks. Our kick combo ends in a spin. Our punch combo goes on infinitely or until we stun an enemy. The idea is you use kicks to corral the enemies or stun them quickly, and you use punches for reliable light jabs that eventually end in a stun. But both punches and kicks are just meant to open up more options by stunning the enemy. When you stun the enemy, as you saw there, we can uppercut them, we can kick them, we can grab and throw them, we can uh, grab them out of the air and throw them, we can throw them into each other. If two are stunned next to each other, we can bash their heads together. There's there's so many options available to you when the enemy becomes stunned, is what I'm trying to get, get at here. There are weapons we can pick up, like this bat. The bat knocks people around, that's sort of its function. It can knock people against the wall and juggle them against it. It does have durability, it flashes when it's about to die. The enemies also have weapons, and we can use their weapons. The enemy types vary immensely in their capabilities. Williams just cartwheels and goes in for one-two punches. Linda has weapons and uses long-range kicks that knock you into the air or just plain knock you on your butt. Williams is the most simple enemy, Linda's the second most simple, but they're still distinctive. The enemy types have so much personality in this game. We also have a dodge function where we can uh, crouch under enemy blows. And if we crouch... Oh, hold on. Let's uh, slam these guys' heads together. Yeah, there we go. I'm just wrecking everyone. 
but uh, the dodge function allows us to duck under enemy blows, but we can also roll to get some quick invincibility frames. Not too many invincibility frames, but we get some from it. We also get Gleam if we perform perfect dodges, and Gleam is a temporary attack boost, so it encourages us to be more aggressive. In general, finding ways to be aggressive with the enemies in this game is super rewarding, because you can play it safe, but almost all of the enemy attacks can be interrupted if you know how to do it, and the ones that can't be interrupted you can get Gleam from, so you can destroy the enemy so much faster like we did just there. Hiya Bobo, we're going to stun you with the whip repeatedly for a bit. But after that, you still won't be a problem because I have your move set downloaded. It's in my brain. You will not touch me. The enemies don't so much telegraph their moves in this game as they twitch a bit. And you, you learn how they work so intimately that you know what twitch means what and how to dodge it. Sometimes you dodge far preemptively, and that's usually better than not dodging, to be clear. But... I, I don't know, that's how a lot of beat-em-ups are, and I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. If beat-em-ups all had their enemies telegraph their attacks perfectly, it would severely limit the way the game works. I think understanding the enemy types so you know when and how they do moves is uh, just as rewarding as understanding telegraphing. The game is also super accessible to people who don't necessarily want to do that, though, because of the RPG mechanics and such. You might have noticed I'm getting health back from every hit I do on enemies. That's not a default or anything, that's the absorb mixtape, because you can equip mixtapes in this game for various effects. That spin kick I've been doing, the really crazy big big one, that's uh, that's not a default thing either. That's the spin spinning kick mixtape. Probably could have guessed that it's called that. That one, yeah, this kick. Man, it is so surreal that I'm talking about Double Dragon Neon right now. I, I think I've barely even mentioned it on the channel, but, you know, I got it in 2012 and I played it so much when it came out. My first save file is at 17 hours. I have several others that are at least 5 hours in. And then I replayed it recently. Hold on, let's get a Bobo in the pit. Yeah, there we go. I replayed it recently with my roommate Nathan, and I just... Well, it came, it came f flooding back to me how, how good it is, and... Uh, you know, it's not always the case that the things you go back to are good, but it is the case with this, that's for sure. Maybe even better than I realized when I first played it in 2012. But, uh, it feels surreal that I'm actually let's playing it now, because I've wanted to for so long, but I always worried I wouldn't be able to do it justice. And it's- the passion, I think, is more important than anything. So I'm glad this is a full, real let's play. The idea with the gun enemies is just that you want to jump in particular around them because of how easily they knock you to the ground. A single shot from their guns knocks you down and they can keep spamming it. They're really the biggest threat. Anyway, here's the boss fight against Mark. Fair warning, after we beat Mark, the game's probably going to crash. For some reason, if you start from a new game and play up to the Mark fight, it always seems to crash after you fight Mark. We're going to cheese Mark out the same way we did Tetsu. But we have to get Mark to get on the same plane as us first, which might be a bit difficult, but I think if we... Yep, yeah, there, there we go. Alright, and we just jump and kick him in the head. Mark isn't as uh, flashy as Tetsu, but Mark does have phases just like Spike, and when we get his phase to shift, he will summon enemies and throw grenades at us with a really goofy, terrible-looking throwing animation, and the grenades will travel in such a strange arc even by video game standards. So I'm looking forward to you seeing that. But aside from that, this is all we do during the boss battle. The henchmen that Mark summons are definitely more threatening than Mark himself. I feel like... I feel like maybe our movement should be affected by a helicopter's blade spinning so close to us. Like, even if not physically, may maybe we should be more terrified of that. Oh, okay, here we go, the phase shift. Look at this grenade. Look, look at- oh man, it looks so much worse than I remember every time I see it. So Mark does that, then we fight his soldiers to get them out of our hair, and then we start kicking Mark in the head again, and that's the whole boss. We just do that until he's done. It's- it's not one of my favorite bosses in Fighters Unleashed. Most of them are tied in how much I- I don't think they're good. But there is one boss that I'm actually not only looking forward to fighting, but I think isn't even all that bad in spite of the various problems the game has. But let's just skip to the end of this fight, huh? 
Dislike law enforcement with a vengeance. They just bullies with the worst of intentions. Just a thought gets me and my friends so mad. Gonna find a cop and kick him in the gold man. I dislike law enforcement with a vengeance. They just bullies with the worst of intentions. Just a thought gets me and my friends so mad. Gonna find a cop and kick him in the gold man. I dislike law enforcement with a vengeance. Okay, there we go, and come on, where is it? Give it to me, come on, where is it? Where is it? Come on. Yeah, there it is, there's the freeze. All right, so we, I, well, I have to do all that again. You don't have to watch me do it all again, but the game froze, so I have to do this again. See you in a minute. Oh boy, so here's the other vehicle section, and this one is stinky. Don't get me wrong, the first one was pretty stinky also. And this one doesn't seem all that bad at first, like we can easily dodge these grenades. But eventually the truck's going to pull back further and reveal another enemy shooting at us. And uh, that's a bit hard to dodge alongside the grenades that are being thrown. Especially since the grenades are not colored well, they blend in with the scenery quite a bit. And the scenery is hard to parse as it is. Yep, here's a guy shooting bullets at us. And uh, you can get a rhythm here to dodge both the grenades and the bullets. It's not easy, but it's doable if you try and count the time between when the bullets fire. It's, it's possible. It's, not, it's not, exactly, uh, not exactly how I would have done things. Probably would have colored the grenade a bit more brightly. But it's, it's not like this is, this is as unfair as the last section, the last vehicle section. Until the truck pulls back again. Which it will do shortly. Because of course it pulls back again. You might also notice we're dealing piss for damage. Which is another problem. Th there's a reason I have so many lives. I have so many lives because I don't feel like trying during the vehicle section. Yep, uh, here, here's the guy with the rocket launcher. And after that happens I just uh, give up. And just start shooting mindlessly. Wasting, wasting my lives because I, I, don't, I didn't sign up for this. You know, I, I didn't sign up for un unfair bullet hell explosion mo motorcycle bike dodgy game. You know, existential and commentary fatigue is telling me that uh, maybe this should be a two-parter, you know? Maybe we should go back to doing things the way we did in 2014 to 2018, just for old times' sake and bring back Let's Plays that come in parts. But is that is that really what I want? Do I really want to set that precedent again? You know, the only areas left are Aurora and Quaddle's level. Am I saying that right? I have a feeling I'm saying Quaddle's name so wrong, but those are the only two levels left. I think that I'm more than strong enough to handle. Hello everyone and welcome to Proxy Blade Zero, a 3D beat-em-up which has some pretty unique ideas for a combat system. We have a regular attack, for example, but we can also press the regular attack in combination with the stance button to add flourish and extra damage to our moves, as you're seeing here. That's why our sword's glowing orange. And I believe we can parry all physical attacks with the parry button, but not projectiles. Some enemies have shields, and we need to remove their shields to deal actual damage to them. They won't take knockback until we remove their shields either. In addition to the flourish attacks, which we can do infinitely, we can also do power attacks like you just saw. But that requires us to hold down the boost button, and it does take our energy meter, which is that meter above our health. Another benefit to flourish attacks is that uh, it makes your movements a lot less predictable, so the enemy has a harder time hitting you, but if you're close enough to them, they will swing. There's a that yellow meter above both our health and energy. If we fill it up all the way, we get to do really cool stuff. That's probably not going to happen. I'm not quite at that skill level yet. That meter fills up based on how well you perform a variety of combos. So, uh, you know, I, I'm confident in my ability to handle the game, just I don't know about that being that good yet. 
We also use the boost to dodge, which, uh, yeah, we want to do so we don't get blown up like that. The enemies drop pickups, and the pickups seem to be randomly decided. Sometimes they drop health, sometimes they drop energy, sometimes they drop a 1-up. That's only happened to me once, though. The parry function, by the way, reacts fast, and it is very lenient. You can parry multiple attacks with it easily. It's not like Metal Gear Rising where you have to press a button and the direction or anything. It's a lot less intensive than that. This is a new enemy type. Big guy swinging a big metal hammer. We can parry instantly, and I think this is the first enemy where they make you learn to parry because of how aggressive this guy is. Like, I don't believe you could get past this guy without parrying. He's just, he just swings that hammer way too fast and way too hard. So yeah, uh, Proxy Blade Zero I, it reminds me a lot of uh, games like Real Metal Slug a fair few times, and if there were ever a Metal Slug game I was ever going to actually be good at, it would probably be the first one. Metal Slug Anthology is nice, but I always lose right around the finale of Metal Slug 3. Alright, I'm going to pause here just to uh, just to take a break real quick. Welcome to the laboratory, where we will be fighting zombies. This green-shirted zombie just swipes his claws at us, he's not really a threat as an enemy type. But there are two more enemy types, as there always are, and they're much more threatening. Let's see if we can, uh... What enemy's spawn seems to be randomly decided. Uh, yeah, this guy can grapple, the zombie in the orange shirt, he can grapple. And the grapple is meant to hold your character in place, but sometimes it doesn't, and you can just walk away while you're supposed to be held in place, and it looks really bad. But the grapple move deals a lot of damage regardless. These flamethrower guys right here that we're juggling, definitely the most difficult enemies in the level. They uh, they can stunlock you super easy with their flamethrowers. Their flamethrowers have a longer range than your attacks. You kind of need to approach them jumping, or try to evade one of their attacks before you go in for a counterattack. With the zombies, you can just sort of rush in, but with the flamethrower guys, they, they will not hesitate to whip that thing out and, and blaze you to death, regardless of what you're doing at the moment. Thankfully, the flamethrowers don't hurt you if you're in the air. Again, jumping around crazily is the meta. You are so invincible while you're in the air, and you can jump pretty much immediately after you land. I think this level is about as far as I made it in my original attempt to beat the game years ago when I was playing as Alexia. I made it around here and then I stopped because the enemies just seemed too cheap and too unfair. But uh, that was before I understood the meta, before I spent a good 10 extra hours learning the game's mechanics. Now I know not only is the game beatable on normal mode, it's beatable on hard mode, because that's what we're doing right now, and I'm fully confident that we will succeed. Um, it's... I think if you gave this game to a normal person, they might tell you it's unplayable and unbeatable. There's, there's a lot of barriers to completing the game. Fighters Unleashed is special. It's like Sonic 06 in that the game actively fights you when you try to play it. A lot of games people consider infamously bad are not are not unplayable by any stretch of the imagination. People just don't like the design. But with Sonic 06 and Fighters Unleashed, it's not about not liking the design. There are things that happen in those games that, that try to force the player out of the experience. No amount of understanding the game or skill at it can remove the fact that it is technically flawed, you know? I think there are many infamously bad games that are quite good, like Mind Jack and Operation Raccoon City. I think those are fine games with good design. They have their flaws, but not any more so than an average game, I would say. There's uh, games that are infamously bad that actually are bad, like Ride to Hell, but Ride to Hell still mostly functions. It doesn't try and stop you from playing it. You can understand it and complete it if you're skilled at it. But games like Fighters Unleashed and Sonic 06 are different. When you try and merge with those games, when you try to become one with them so you can perform as well as possible, the game fights you, and it fights you in a way that you can't fight against with its technical issues. Some of the mechanics and ideas just objectively don't function, and it's sad. Because a lot of the times, you know, people say something doesn't function, and it does. It works fine, 
They just didn't understand the mechanics well enough. And I can't say that about Fighters Unleashed. Also, I know I mentioned a lot of Fighters Unleashed's flaws already, but another one is that the game just drops your inputs sometimes. I wish I had a controller display so you could see, because that's a very, very rough claim. Like, that that's uh, that slander is saying that a game's controls don't actually respond. But it's true, sometimes you'll be rearing up to, do, to go in and combo people in the air and it just won't go. It's rare, but it, it happens. In one playthrough it happened multiple times in a row and I questioned my sanity. And I'm not a stranger to just pressing buttons at the wrong time. I've played a lot of beat-em-ups that are pretty high skill. I know that sometimes you just goof up inputs or sometimes the timing is very particular. And it seems that way by design, and that's fine. But this isn't one of those cases, I promise you. Um, let me see what else I have here. Trigger Man on the PS2. Been mentioning a lot of third-person shooters in this video. But Trigger Man on the PS2, third-person stealth shooter. Really hard, really, really hard. And some people would probably say unfair. But it functions, and if you get good at it, you can beat it without being surprised, without having the game, like, tear you to pieces with its de Oh, we're good. Or at least I rather desperately would have liked to say that we are good, but as you can see, that's not the case. It's time for this level, which is like the other level, but more of it. Just like every other. Hello everyone, and welcome to Kung Fu Strike the Warrior's Rise, which is quickly becoming one of my favorite beat-em-ups. This game is hard, and we're going to be playing it on hard mode because I'm a show-off. So the key to this game is all about understanding the combat system. First things first, you want to hold down the attack button, because that gets your character attacking in a constant, never-ending combo, and you don't even need to tap to do the next hit. You just hold the button down. Next, we can use chi attacks by building up a meter, and these special attacks can be used to interrupt enemies' attacks or clear out multiple enemies at a time. We can also parry by pressing the parry button just before an enemy's attack hits us. This stuns the enemy and makes them glow green, and while they're glowing green, if we hit them, we gain some health back. It's about finding a rhythm. We also have a dodge. Some moves can be difficult to parry with the proper timing, so of course we want to dodge instead. That, that makes sense to me, at least. Uh, we have a few other mechanics, like we can summon in guys to help us, and we have different kinds of chi attacks. You've seen me use at least two so far. But the basics are to parry at the right time, like that. Do you see how many guys I just parried with my skills? It's far from the game's biggest problem, but the simplistic backgrounds are really grating. Most beat-em-ups have a sense of progression throughout the level. The backgrounds certainly don't loop as senselessly as this one does, where we see so many giant crazy supervillain monitors in a row. So this boss, here we're fighting against Billy and Jimmy, a pair of mutants, and the idea is that we jump over their claw swipes, sometimes their claw gets stuck in the ground, and then we can hit them while their claw is stuck in the ground. And this boss fight works. It actually works 100%. The, their vulnerability phase works the way it's supposed to, their attacks are predictable, Th they can be dodged. This is probably a boss I can beat without getting hit rather easily, even. And more than the boss just functioning, I think the design is cool. I like that at first it seems erratic, but that there's a sensible pattern to it all. Like, they behave in ways that are easily understandable after you spend a few minutes on the boss fight. That's a thing in a lot of great beat-em-ups, is that at first it seems like utter chaos, but then you grow to understand it. You become one with the game, as I so often strive to. And the reward for that is that you see patterns that you didn't before. Do I think that Billy and Jimmy have a bit too much health? Yeah, I do. But that's fine, honestly. This boss fight functions, its design is okay, I can handle a bit of repetition. I've been dealing with repetition the whole game. That said, just because I can, and will, deal with it, doesn't mean you should have to.
Get ready. Go. Welcome at long last to the final area where we fight Quaddle's men. There are three enemy types, three new ones, as always. Only one of them is worth worrying about, and we haven't met him yet, but he will be a gentleman in a yellow suit, and his punches reach far, he does so much damage, and that's why he's threatening. No projectile enemies this time, though. None of that. Whenever we do run into a yellow-suited guy, we don't usually want to approach straight on. We want to dodge one of his attacks first with a jump and then go in for a combo if possible. But we're in the final area, so you'll forgive me if I'm a bit worn out at this point, because I know we're going to win. We have more than enough lives to make it to Quaddle and take him down. You know, when I was starting this Let's Play, after practicing Fighters Unleashed for so long, I wasn't expecting that I would need two separate coping mechanisms to deal with trying to commentate over the game. You know, I, I figured I figured I could speed up the, the video a bit and put in some songs from Double Dragon Neon and that would be cute. I didn't also figure that I, I would need to play other beat-em-ups alongside this one just to give my brain something to focus on and really dig into. But hey, if it weren't for Fighters Unleashed, I probably wouldn't have revisited Kung Fu Strike so soon, and I love Kung Fu Strike. Proxy Blade Zero, it's been sitting in my Steam library for forever, and I just never got around to it. Uh, Double Dragon Neon, I, I, was, I played that either way. So, like, I already played that with Nathan, independent of Fighters Unleashed. But it, it, experiencing it alongside a game like Fighters Unleashed in any context is something to appreciate. Playing the, some of the best of the genre alongside the worst of the genre. There's something fun about that. I do really like how grimy and foreboding and dark and surreal the game gets when you when you hit the laboratory stage and after that. Like, this is presumably a street. It doesn't look like a street in an active city. This looks like the post-apocalypse we're wading through right now. And I think it really fits the tone of the late game. You know, before you were just having a fun romp beating up dudes to get your girlfriend. Now there are, like, creepy experiments, and who knows what's waiting for you when you actually do go see Quaddle. But you can bet it's not going to be good given this atmosphere. There's a building sense of dread and unease about it all, and I like that a lot. There are some things I think are, are very appreciable about this game in spite of its many flaws. Still would call it the worst commercially made, uh, sorry, commercially available beat-em-up ever made, though. I kind of like that this video's become a showcase of Fighters Unleashed as a bad revitalization of the beat-em-up genre, alongside me playing so many better revitalizations of the genre that exist at the same time. Like, beat-em-ups are back, baby, and that's great. Fighters Unleashed just isn't a great beat-em-up. I brought up the high-profile competition Fighters Unleashed was going against earlier on in the video, like Double Dragon Neon and Scott Pilgrim and Castle Crashers and The Takeover, but there are some less well-known indies that still did the job better, even if they're not as glamorous, like The Ass Kickers. Wouldn't exactly call it great, has a fair share of problems. Definitely succeeded at, at, the, at carrying the genre's legacy on better than this. There's also Fist Puncher, that comes to mind, and I'm trying to be careful to only mention games that were already released while Fighters Unleashed was in development, just to be fair. And it's not as though those games existing means you can't make Fighters Unleashed. By all means, please keep making more beat-em-ups. Don't even necessarily worry about the competition. I, I just wanted to draw attention to the fact that Fighters Unleashed was hosed from pretty much every angle. I realize I'm not making making developing beat-em-ups sound attractive right now, but I'll play and enjoy your beat-em-up. I'm enjoying this one. And in spite of all I've said, would I change anything about Fighters Unleashed? No. No, I wouldn't. The game is its own art right now. It's, it's not performing well at what it set out to do, but that's fine. That's part of what makes it beautiful. It's already made. No need to go tampering with it. Oh, uh, all of the games I've been cutting away to, by the way, Proxy Blade Zero, Double Dragon, 
Neon, Kung Fu Strike. You can get all of those on Steam right now, I'm pretty sure. I don't think any of them have been delisted, so if any of those looked interesting to you, they're available. It bears repeating, Kung Fu Strike is hard. It is a hard game, and you need to very thoroughly understand the combat system. I've retried levels tens of times before I cleared them on normal mode. It's... it's rough. You can do it. It's... it's just rough. In a good way. Here we are in the world's longest goddamn hallway. It is such a long hallway. And we're gonna use this opportunity to talk about Alexia's story. In Alexia's story, you fight the gangs a bit out of order compared to Charlie's, and the story is lesser. Alexia is still going to try and find Megan, of course, but unlike Charlie, Alexia is not Megan's date. Alexia is just Megan's friend, and while it is the case that Alexia repeatedly asks where Megan is and what's going on, no one answers her, but everyone gives Charlie the information he needs even more than he needs most times. So even though she has her own cutscenes, it's definitely the case that if you care about the story at all, you're going to be playing as Charlie. I also like Charlie's design better. I like the white and orange combo quite a lot. Did you know this hallway has over 50 enemies in it? You have to fight 50 of these guys, and that's so many, especially on hard mode where their health- Hello everyone and welcome to Sacred Citadel, a traditional side-scrolling beat-em-up with some RPG elements. We have light and heavy attacks, which we can mix together for various combos, used to knock the enemies away or just plain knock them down, or uppercut them where we can then combo them in the air. Very simple control scheme, very effective, easy to pick up, and it takes a bit to master. I wouldn't say it's hard to master. Everything in the game is pretty straightforward. The music in the game is very reminiscent of Super Nintendo and Genesis style music, which I think is interesting because that's not usually the style most retro sound soundtracks go for, but I like it, especially since it sounds quite a bit like Golden Axe. And uh, the, the game, the thing in this game is managing crowds of enemies using your combos, because that's what they're for. You can uppercut several enemies at once, and enemies don't really attack you while you're in the air juggling other enemies. You can... Oh, oh, environmental hazards. We can use our knockback combo to throw the enemies into this log, and it'll swing back and forth and deal pretty massive damage to them. It will also deal massive damage to us if we get hit by it, so we want to avoid that by staying toward the very bottom or very top of the screen. In addition to our combos being used to manage crowds of enemies, we also have a dodge function, of you, as you've seen a few times. Most notably, the dodge goes in all four directions. This is the only beat-em-up I can think of off the top. No, wait, I think Fist Puncher also let you dodge in all four directions. But it's one of few, anyway, where you can dodge up, down, left, and right. And learning to dodge with proper timing is very important. Thankfully, the dodge is very lenient, and the enemy's attacks are well telegraphed. Do you get it yet? Are you, under, are you grasping how much I love beat-em-ups? I need to know if it's getting through the screen. Alright, so here we are up against Kowaddle, the final boss. And we can't actually hurt Kowaddle until we destroy all of his henchmen. He just won't take damage before then. Which is a weird gimmick, but it's fine, I suppose. The henchmen, after all, are more threatening than Quaddle himself. And for all of Quaddle's fancy moves, and they are really fancy looking, he's no more difficult than any of the other bosses we were able to cheese via this method. We're just going to be jumping up here, kicking him in the head over and over until he summons more goons, and then we'll do it again. And it's not like this is the only beat-em-up where this is a thing you can do. I want to be fair. There are plenty of other beat-em-ups with bosses you can cheese. Even really good beat-em-ups have bosses you can cheese. The final boss of Streets of Rage 3, infamously difficult, you can totally break it using Axel's jump kicks. Very easily. Final boss of Final Fight 2, same deal, jump kicks to death. But you know, those games had other things going on. And I don't even necessarily think cheese is a bad thing or always a flaw with the game. Sometimes cheese can be a good thing. It can make you feel like you've solved a puzzle. 
And that's a lot of why I play beat-em-ups in the first place, is because I like solving puzzles. And that may not seem right. To a lot of people, that probably sounds crazy. Why would you play a game about punching dudes over and over to solve puzzles? But that's what you're doing. You're figuring out how, to, how these guys work, so that you can solve them. Every, every single enemy is a puzzle, and the puzzles get more complex and more crazy the more different enemies you throw together, and bosses are often the biggest puzzles of all. I'm still solving a problem, using my brain to work out a solution, even if it's not what people traditionally consider a puzzle. And for a long time, and still to a lot of people, including my ex-boss, there was this stigma around beat-em-ups that you turn your brain off to play them. And, I mean, there are some where that's the case. I even like some where that's the case. But there are plenty where it's not. Like the old arcade beat-em-ups. And games like Streets of Rage. And, and... There, there's so many beat-em-ups that are really hard for good reasons. And a lot of people just give up when they can't mash their way through. And I find that so frustrating. You just have to put thought into the game mechanics and the enemy types and figure out what you're doing. It just hurts a little inside, seeing games like Kung Fu Strike or God Hand or Spider-Man 3 on the PS3 and 360, which have really complex and thoughtful combat systems with a lot of potential depth that people don't even try to figure out. And it's not like old beat-em-ups are all that different. Their combat systems may be less complex, but you benefit immensely from thinking carefully about every action you take. And then eventually, after you've studied a game enough, it doesn't matter whether the combat system was initially complex or simple anymore. You've become zen. You've gained oneness with the game. You are speaking its language, and it's sort of poetry. Surprise, we have to fight Quaddle again. Is anything different this time? Well, all of his moves are the same. This time he just doesn't summon any guys. So it's the same fight, only even more tedious. And I'm not about to let you sit through it. Sorry.
Ah, it's done. It's done. Beat every level on hard mode. You saw it. Proof that the hard mode ending was never coded into the game. The, the true ending isn't real. It never existed. Games preserved. I, I beat this game's ass. I did it. Game's done. I won. I won Fighters Unleashed. We're done here.